Turning Point is brought to you by PC Wealth Management of Morgan Stanley Smith Barney and the law firm of Duffy & Duffy, protecting the victims of medical error. We're back with former Governor David Patterson. Governor, the second you took office, governor, for for governor, scandals everywhere. The the Spitzer situation came up. You, I I think you disclosed some information. You made a decision to disclose some information, and they kind of beat you up on that. The one thing I want to talk to you about are these Yankee tickets, right? (laughs) You, you went to the Yankees World Series game, and, and for the life of me, I can't understand this. You went to the Yankees World Series game, and you ended up paying a $61,000 fine? Just give us a little background on this. Well, my counsel wrote a letter to the Yankees saying that uh, the governor would like to come to the World Series, just the governor. And um, that letter never appeared in the Public Integrity Commission's report. They made it appear that we didn't give any notice at all and just came to the game and demanded to be let in. And um, I think the Public Integrity Commission was the non-public, no-integrity commission because the way way they handled the situation was completely uh, negligent. And remember, this is the same Public Integrity Commission that leaked information about the Troopergate investigation. This was the police following Joe Bruno. And... They leaked this information. The inspector general wanted to indict three of them and get rid of the whole, I mean, subpoena the whole board. And at that point, there was so much chaos going on in the state, I said, no, what we'll do is we'll just ask them all to resign. When I asked them to resign, they refused to resign. And I knew in that moment that if anything ever came up, they would take full advantage of it. So uh, I wound up paying a $61,000 fine for going to the Yankee game uh, uh, and not paying for the tickets. See, the I, funny thing is, Frank, the legislature last year took our interpretation of the law on that subject and reaffirmed it by writing a new law. If the uh, Yankees are in the World Ser- Series this year, the governor can go free of charge because they're the governor's constituents, for goodness sakes. I, I thought, I thought that you're, you're supposed to be there. You're the governor. The Yankees are New York. I mean, this is a New York team. Bring a, they bring a lot of revenue in. They bring in a lot of attention to the state. I would have been angry if you didn't show up to the game. I had no idea you pay for tickets or you don't pay for tickets. The governor of the state of New York is supposed to pay for Yankee tickets for the World Series. It should be there. It should be almost mandatory that you're at a game like that. And, you know, when the governor goes to things, you still need a press secretary and uh, you need security and you need people to help you with things. This is part of, of being governor. And, uh, and then I committed a cardinal sin. I brought my son to see the World Series yeah, with me. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, but that's, I, I mean, obviously there was a setup. I, I was going to ask you, who do you think set you up? But I, I think that it's clear, right? It's clear what happened. What was interesting was that the, whatever they call themselves, Public Integrity Commission released a report before they'd finished writing it because they had thought that because of another accusation, I was going to resign, and they just wanted to be in the story. They wanted to make it appear that they had thrown me out of office. Guess what? Now they're out of office. <laughs> did, did you ever discuss resigning or ever consider resigning? No, because I hadn't done anything wrong. Did, and uh, I did uh, choose not to run for re-election because I knew I couldn't defend myself, govern the state, and run for office at the same time. But I would never resign. And a lot of people told me that I should. And there were all these predictions that I would. And uh, people trumped up uh, accusations against me. Uh, the, only other, the only thing that ever happened to me was I had to pay a fine, which I could have appealed. But I didn't because it would have cost me more money in legal bills to pay the lawyers than it would to have paid the fine. Yeah, I mean, that's 
that's the case, right? It would have cost you a fortune. And you're not a, yeah. you're not a rich guy. You're not loaded. Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> and you say that with no, uh, no shame. I mean, you, 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 know, you work for your money, that's for sure. Well, I, I think that um, the legislature, the new governor, uh, the new heads of these good government groups have done an excellent job really reversing the political nature of the good government process. Um, uh, people doing contracts. One of the good government group heads had to resign themselves when the legislature passed a law that the good government groups have to disclose who is donating to them because they were doing deals. Corrupt people. And one thing about being corrupt, it's one thing when you're just an elected official, it's corrupt, but when you're calling yourself good government and you are that um, dishonest, uh, I, I think it was an absolute shame, but I must say the new administration and a lot of the uh, very effective good government people have cleaned up that process, and I don't think it'll happen to anyone else in the near future. On a political note, purely political, when President Obama was running for office and it looked like he was uh, certainly gaining traction, he released a book, and the book disclosed about, I guess, cocaine use or drug use. And he got it out early enough where it wouldn't turn into an October surprise from somewhere. And a lot of people point to that and say, you know what, that was, that's the way you handle something like that. If you have something that's going to come up from your youth, lay it out there. And I think when you took office, when you first, well, when, when you took office of governor, right after Spitzer left, you had that same type of thought in your mind. Let me disclose some things and, and let me put it out there. In retrospect, would you have done the same thing? Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that um, uh, they now have a term called stealing the thunder, uh, which I guess I invented, which is if the press is going to come after you for something, beat them to the punch. And uh, I think I was credited for doing that. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I was a kid growing up in the late 60s and early 70s and I uh, tried a few drugs like a lot of people did. You know, went on and lived my life the way everyone else pretty much did. Um, I had said it, by the way, 10 times before, but I had to say it again when I was governor because uh, pr prior to that, it never made a, it seemed not to make a difference to anyone. Uh, I was separated. I had, um, uh, you know, relationships while I was separated, and, and I thought I would talk about that as well. But the... Um, in retrospect, would you have done the same but thing? But in retrospect, uh, you know, we've talked about this. It kind of ignites a feeding frenzy where you're constantly, the, the media, you know, they got the Spitzer story, now they're trying to run, see if they can get me out of office. Everyone you know, everything you've ever done gets vetted in, a, in, a, in an extremely intrusive way that really hurt my family, um, has angered uh, my wife to this day. And in, in retrospect, I don't know if I would have been as forthcoming uh, as I was at the time, because doing it the day after he was sworn in as governor was explosive. I, I think maybe in, in retrospect, we would have just waited. And as President Obama did, you put it out when you want to put it out. Right. See, I wonder if you would have gotten a, a honeymoon period if you didn't do that. And I don't mean to second guess you, but you're coming in as the first African-American well, well, governor. Well, they weren't giving me a honeymoon. They, they were definitely coming after me. Yeah, you, and, you uh, knew and, that was happening. Yeah, and, and not as much other than the fact that when there's a big story, it really hypes up the media. In other words, because now they're, they're jealous of uh, whoever broke the original stories. The Times, for instance, broke the um, Spitzer story, and everybody is now trying to keep up with the Times. And it, it's, it, it's kind of a feeding frenzy. But I do think that, um, that feeding it only makes it bigger. You know, yes. like uh, a little shop of horrors, you know, the yeah. plant. It's eating everything. <laughs> right. and, uh, and in retrospect, even though I got a lot of credit for it, even though the polls showed that the percentage of people who cared about uh, what went on in my marriage, what went on in my early life was somewhere between 10 and 12 percent. Very few people really cared about it. But it put me in a place where I noticed that every time someone had a problem with me over legitimate issues, like me trying to cut spending when the state's about to uh, go into uh, bankruptcy, a default, 
uh, insolvency, that they would bring up these issues. When just because they were mad about what I was saying from a policy perspective, and um, and I think uh, if you notice now, this new governor has put people in the position where he's let them know that if they try to abuse him, he will abuse them, and it's a it's been a brilliant uh, way of of stopping the um, uh, the the. Uh, very negative way uh, that I was treated. Thus far, it's working. We'll be back with David Patterson. Turning Point with Frank McKay is brought to you by Atlantic Honda, New York's auto giant, and Herman Katz, Can Jimmy and Klein, property tax attorneys and advisors. The Turning Point is brought to you by Smith DeGroat Real Estate, serving the tri-state area since 1955, and CAI, insurance solutions since 1961, on the web at www.conferenceny.com. We are back with the former governor of New York State, David Patterson. Governor, when Saturday Night Live lampooned you, and anybody who's watching this or anybody who knows you, realizes you're not a bumbling, stumbling guy. Uh, how was that? How did you find that? Well, Frank, I think you know that I can take a joke. And I make jokes about my blindness myself. But when Saturday Night Live <clears throat> aired that broadcast, nearly 70% of blind people in this country are not working because of the Mr. Magoo sort of impressions that people have about blind people. So. I thought it was my responsibility to stand up for all those people who have ability and talent, whose education proficiency is higher than the national average, but they can't get jobs. And it's because of these perceptions about the blind and also about the deaf and about other dis disabilities. And so um, I stood up to them and uh, then inevitably uh, I went on the show how did you stand up to them? What did you do? Well, we had a press conference uh, condemning them for doing this. And my press people didn't want to do it. They said, oh, let's just take it as a joke and they'll let you come on Saturday Night Live. And I thought that would be me taking advantage of uh, an opportunity while other dis disabled people are being harangued. So uh, about a year and a half later, finally, the National Federation of the Blind, the only disability group to stand up for me at that time, encouraged me, go on the show and make fun of them. And that's exactly what I did. <laughs> you did well. You were nervous about getting on there, though, right? Well, you know, right in the middle of the skit, I'm looking around, and uh, Fred Armisen is there, and, and Seth, and all of a sudden, Amy, and all the Saturday Night Crew, and they're reading cue cards. And I'm uh, uh, <laughs> relying on my ability just to react to the situation. So I was pretty happy about the way it came out. Yeah, and, no, it and to be honest, Saturday Night Live let me write pretty much my own script, and I'm uh, indebted to them for that. Did they continue the skit after that? Um, they make a little crack about me here and there, uh, even you know, to this day. Not, not with the intensity that they did before, but I'm the only person that ever got lampooned on Saturday Night Live who got a public apology while I was on the show. So uh, I'm in the Saturday Night Live record book. Yeah. I mean, I think ultimately it was a, it was a win. But again, it didn't start out that way, and it was, a, you know, it was certainly a little well, insensitive, if not malicious. I went to Columbia University. I went to law school right here in Long Island at Hofstra. Um, I had been a, a legislator who became the minority leader, was picked to become lieutenant governor. Um, I had done a number of things in my life, but all I'm known for is bouncing off of walls. Yeah. And, uh, and there are people who, unfortunately, bounce off walls, and you can make fun of it. But what bothered me is it was the only interpretation that they were giving of, of my uh, work and my personality was, uh, you know, in this negative way. And uh, so I went on and, and uh, gave it back to them a little bit. You know, the truth is, and I say this, not in your presence, I say this to anyone, you're, you're a brilliant guy, I mean, you really are. I mean, you, you develop a political strategy, uh, uh, analyze the situation better than anyone I know. You really do it well, and I'm not saying that just because you're here, but you go on Saturday Night Live and you different things in the press, and you really get, uh, I guess, uh, stereotyped a certain way. And uh, how does that make you feel? I mean, forget about Saturday Night Live, we spoke about that. What about the press in general? 
Well, I think um, uh, the media likes to uh, to spend a lot of time on stereotypical conduct as people are emerging, and uh, you know, and I I thought a lot of that was uh, in in my case unnecessary. Um, and but then I can't blame the media in some respects because I knew at some point somebody was feeding them a lot of this material, and uh, and you kind of can't play, blame them for printing that. But I think I really aroused the ire of a lot of people by taking positions that were opposite the way I had worked as a legislator, pretty much a progressive agenda. But when I became governor, I thought that I had to uh, to cut the spending and reduce the deficit by f over $40 billion in just the four years that I was there. And I've noticed that the new governor, uh, Andrew Cuomo, has done exactly the same thing. But people are used to that now, so he doesn't get nearly the pushback. I mean, they get upset when he does things, but they don't personally ridicule him uh, the way I did uh, with me. And, um, and I suggest that they don't, or they'll really be sorry. <laughs> right. Because uh, this governor, I think, uh, in his first... 15 months is as good as a governor as this state has ever seen. And for those who don't know, you're talking about Andrew Cuomo. Yes. Uh, you think he has aspirations to be president? I think whether he has them or not, his name's going to come up in 2016 because of the tremendous job he's done here in New York. A lot of victories early on, that's for sure. Incredible victories. And, and some I couldn't be happier about because I tried to do it myself. But... Um, He's a good closer. <laughs> Interesting to hear you say that. I think a lot of people felt that when you were running, or when you were still talking about running for office, that it was Andrew that was, uh, that was pushing for you to get out. I mean, do you feel that way? No, I, I think he probably reacted the same way that I did to Governor Spitzer. I don't think he wanted to see any harm come to me. I don't think he thought I had done anything wrong, and I don't, I don't think he uh, helped it along at all, but, you know, if it clears the way for you to become governor, sure. you're not going to walk away from it. Right, right. And I didn't, so I can't uh, blame him if he wasn't kind of, you know, it would be kind of good if this guy didn't run for re-election. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, it's good of you to see that, see it that way, but I mean, certainly, uh, I think it's working out for both of you. I mean, I've wondered who uh, really were doing some of these things, because they were clearly scripted, and even the media told me someone was selling stories that were completely erroneous to try to make me look bad. But now that I'm out of office and doing other things, I've just kind of left that to the universe. How does the media treat you now that you're one of them? Well, now I'm in the media, so uh, when they start with me, I have a microphone too, and uh, I can... Uh, Do they start with you? No, nah, I think um, pretty much at the point that I didn't run for uh, re-election and all these you know, ridiculous charges, Yankees tickets and everything went away. I think they've been actually... Uh, um, very fair to me. I know when you announced that you weren't going to run for re-election, you changed and I'm, dramatically. Your confidence in that office changed. And I'm talking privately. You know, Frank, it's interesting you bring that up because I have thought now, with the distinct advantage of hindsight, that what I should have done when I came in office and I knew I was going to clash with the legislature like no governor ever had, trying to forestall insolvency in the midst of a recession that would be the longest recession this country will ever see, bordering on a depression. What I should have done was said then, I'm not running for re-election, I'm here to clean up a mess. Because as soon as I got off of my back that people could hurt me politically uh, because I wasn't doing what they wanted me to do, as soon as I didn't care anymore, I thought that the... Uh, from March 2010 until I left, that last 10 months, I was very happy with my work. That was when we invented the idea of using the extenders to keep government going to make the cuts we need to make. That's the uh, precursor to Governor Cuomo now saying that he will put the pension reforms into the extenders if they don't pass the budget on time. I don't think we'll ever see a late budget in the state again, Frank, uh, as a result of that. And then, at one point, when the uh, uh, legislature um, tried to put in a lot of spending that I didn't like, 
uh, and they put it in 6,000 different measures, knowing that I couldn't uh, veto them all at the same time. I sat down and turned a camera on on YouTube and sat there for eight and a half hours and vetoed every single one by hand. It almost killed me, but I think it showed that I wasn't going to get pushed around. And once I started to push back, um, I found that um, some of the gossips and some of the you know people who were not kind to me, they had no place to go because I wasn't running for re-election. And in the end, uh, I think we got a lot done in 2010. What was the turning point in your life? You know, it's funny, Frank, the turning point in my life occurred right here in Long Island. I was an honor student at Columbia, and I was trying to gra graduate school early, and I heard about a summer job working for a catering service right out here in Long Island. And uh, the person who ran it was the husband of an itinerant teacher, a special teacher uh, uh, that had helped me in school. and. Uh, they told me to round up 15 kids to work there. I rounded up 14 and put my name on the list. And they hired everyone except me, and I knew it was because of my disability. And um, I went back to Columbia and almost flunked out because I felt, why am I trying so hard in school if I can't get a job when I, when I come out? This was in the early 70s. I think this was a kid who was clearly in need of counseling. and. Um, I almost flunked out of school. I left school for two years and came back. And I went to see an old professor of mine. And he said, David, during this whole situation, I know you're upset at the friends of yours who took the job. I know you're upset at the guy for not hiring you. I know you're upset even maybe your family for not realizing they did it to you for your disability. He said, but instead of getting upset, you didn't do anything to help yourself. You should have gone down there and protested. And he said, what you should do now is since working is so important, leave school, work for a couple of years, then go back and get your degree. And I went and got a job in a credit union, and I worked for a couple of years. I went back and finished college, went on to law school, and the stone that the builder refused became the governor of the state of New York. Yeah. Very good. What's next? What do you do from here? Well, I have my uh, radio program from 4 to 6 every day on WOR 710 AM. It's here in New York. I teach here at NYU. I work with a man named Joe Grano, who once ran UBS and Payne Weber on an investment fund that he's building for, uh, to develop green housing. I do some work on what they call EB5, which is the process that people from other countries, if they can create jobs in this country, can win the opportunity to uh, become legal permanent residents here. They, they would get a green card. And I consult for the National Federation of the Blind, who helped me in the Saturday Night Live issue. And, uh, I'm always open to new ideas and suggestions. Would you ever run for office again? I don't think I would, because um, it takes a lot out of you. It takes a lot out of your family. Uh, it's funny. Um, people ask me to do things sometimes now, and I tell them, no, I really can't make it. And they're like, well, we really need you. And I tell them, you know something? For 25 years I did this. Uh, it took a toll on, it takes a toll on every aspect of your life. Your family life, your marriage, even your uh, relationships with friends. And I think that it's the reason we really need term limits, because after a while, anyone who doesn't think that that kind of scrutiny and that kind of publicity and the pressure of some of these offices doesn't get to you is seriously mistaken. On that thought, do you want your children to go into politics? Well, they don't seem to have a proclivity to want to, so I'll probably not have to worry about it, but I want my children to be happy. So whatever makes them happy, uh, uh, you know, I, I admire people who are in government right now. Uh, they give a lot. Uh, they get ridiculed a lot. Um, sometimes they take advantage, but most of the people that I know in government work very, very hard. I hear your name every once in a while when Charlie Rangel's seat comes up. Have you heard your name uh, mentioned for that seat? Yeah, I've heard it. Uh, uh, you know, there were all these articles about how I'm supposed to replace him. And, um, you know, I, I don't know who makes this stuff up, but it's great reading. <laughs> Do you read the bad press? Yeah, I always did. Everybody says they don't read it. They do. I heard President Clinton said, never read the newspapers. And I asked him about it once, and he kind of shrugged, well, you know. He does, right? Yeah, he, he reads it. As painful as it is, we all read that, even when it's made up. Yeah. Governor, you've been a great guest, good friend. <laughs> Thank you so much.
Frank, this is a great show. Here. Thank you. And your show is great as well. I'd love to do it. We've been with Governor David Patterson. Thanks for being here.